Okay, we like to start uh, basically on time. It's a, a nice thing to do for every for all of you who did show up on time to start on time. So uh, we will uh, we will get going right now. Um, share my screen and. Okay, we've been uh, dealing with the same verses for uh, for quite a few weeks now, and we will continue to deal with it at least today, and maybe also next week. Also, he who fatally strikes a man shall be put to death. If he did not do it by design, but it came about by an act of God, I will assign you a place to which he can flee. When a man schemes against another and kills him treacherously, you shall take him from my very altar to be put to death. And I, uh, I highlighted the word here, let or go. I just want to talk a little bit about the verb that is used here in this text for killing. Notice that in the first verse, it's make ish vamit. Uh, it's more descriptive, struck uh, another person and that other person died. But here it's le or go. And the verb, as we pointed out, is la, is harag, uh, which is translated here as kill, which is good translation. And the question that I'd like to begin today's class with is the question of whether there is a difference in Hebrew between murdering and killing. And some of you may know this already, but I think it's worth studying again that uh, Rashbam, Rabbi Samuel Ben Meir, who most of you know is my favorite uh, uh, Bible commentator, uh, makes a big deal about the difference between murdering and killing. Uh, here is his comment. He comments on the difference between these verbs in his commentary on the Ten Commandments. Lo tirzach. And he writes, I'll read the Hebrew for a second and then look at the English uh, translation. I just want you to hear in the Hebrew, those of you who understand the Hebrew, the repetitive nature of what Rashbam is saying. Repetitive because he's trying to make the point unambiguously, really strongly. Kol ritzicha hariga bechinam hi bechol makom. Every time the verb ratzach appears, ratzach always, whenever it appears, refers to unjustified homicide. So I'm sure you all know that when translating the, uh, the Ten Commandments, the question is how to translate the Sixth Commandment, which many people translate as thou shalt not kill, you shall not kill, and others translate it as you shall not murder. And Rashbam is coming down very clearly on the side that the text actually means murder. And then he explains the difference between the verb lirzoach and the verb laharok. And so he says that the reish tzadi chet, the verb reish tzadi chet is always used for unjustified homicide, harigab bechinam, killing for no particular, for no, uh, good reason. Um, for example, the murderer must be put to death. Mot yumat arrotzeach. So the rotzeach there obviously means somebody who committed an unjustified killing. 
So what's a justified killing? Just, just to be clear, so justified killing could be if I'm, let's say, I'm defending my own life. Somebody's coming to, uh, somebody's coming to kill me. In English, if somebody was coming to kill me and I killed them first, I wouldn't say, if I'm speaking English, I wouldn't say I murdered him. Because murder it implies culpability. Or if I'm a soldier in the army and there's a battle going on and I killed one of the people from the enemy who was trying to kill me, I wouldn't say I murdered him. Uh, we just don't do that in English. We don't use the verb murder in that way. And Rashbam uh, here is making the point that the Hebrew verb lirtsoch is like the English uh, verb uh, uh, to murder. And it is used only for unjustified homicide. Uh, so the first example, Mot Yumat a passage talking about uh, how, to, uh, how to deal with somebody who committed premeditated homicide. Haratzachta vigam irashta, the prophet says this to the king uh, who, uh, who, who killed to King Ahav. Eliyahu says this to King Ahav, who, uh, who killed his, uh, his neighbor, Navot, and took over his, uh, his vineyard. Would you murder and also take possession? How could you do something like this? This, is, this was unjustified uh, uh, killing. And Yeshayahu writes, Tzedek yalin bava Righteousness used to dwell in Jerusalem, and nowadays is murderers there. And so there again, the verb resh tzadichet is being used for uh, unjustified homicide. But the verbs harag and mut, lahamit, sometimes refer to unjustified homicide. For example, and he, Cain, killed him by yahargehu. So it's the same thing in English. We could say, you know, when we're talking about somebody who committed premeditated homicide, we could say he committed murder, or we could say he killed that person. And, and, and so the verb kill, the verb kill in English isn't taking a stand. It could be referring to somebody who committed unjustified killing, and it could be referring to somebody who uh, defended his own life <clears throat> or who killed some enemy of the uh, uh, of the people in in a uh, uh, in a battle uh, and and uh, is getting a hero's uh, 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 is being rewarded as a hero for having done this this killing. So the so uh, Rashbam points out that just like the verb kill in English, so the verb laharog in Hebrew can be referring either to an unjustified killing, like when Cain kills Abel, it says by Yahar Gehu, the Yesh Petin, and it also can be used when uh, referring to a justified killing. Kamo the Haragta et Aisha, you shall kill the woman. This is referring to a, a court of law uh, and the uh, the example that Rashbaum gives here, I kept wondering, uh, uh, over the years, I always wondered why, uh, why Rashbaum took this uh, not so uh, pleasant uh, example. The, the text there is talking about a woman who, uh, uh, who is guilty of bestiality. And it says, you, you shall kill the woman. What it means is to execute the woman. In other words, this is something that the law is, um, the, the law is suggesting that so today, uh, I decided that I'd look into the question. I found out that uh, I found that actually the verb laharog uh, being used for the action of a Beit Din actually appears only three times in the Bible, only in three verses in the Bible. One about a male indulging in bestiality. The second one about a woman indulging in bestiality. And the third one is in the uh, book of Tabarim and a description of a nasit of someone who is enticing uh, people to go and, and, uh, uh, to go and uh, worship idols. So those are the uh, three examples, none of them all that pleasant that <laughs> Rashbam had to uh, choose from for using harag 
uh, as uh, referring to what a bait dean does, but his his point seems to be very clear, and we English speakers totally understand this uh, this point because we do make a uh, a strong difference in our language between murder and kill, and uh, and as Rashbam says about Hebrew, we do the same thing in English. We use the verb kill both to describe a uh, a killing that we think is justified. For example, even if you're against uh, uh, even if you're against capital punishment, but you still know that when somebody's trying to kill you, when the soldiers of the enemy are coming and trying to kill you, uh, it is considered justified to defend your life and end up killing uh, the uh, the enemy. And you can also use kill to, to describe an unjustified kill. But murder, we would only use for unjustified killing. And so Rashbam is making the point here that, uh, if, you know, if he, uh, if he spoke English, he would be saying to us, you have to translate the sixth commandment here as you shall not commit murder and not as you shall not kill. We'll talk after we read his entire comment here, we're talking about why he is making this uh, comment and why is he making this comment so forcefully. Um, the beginning is this, this uh, he says, Kol ritzicha b'chol makom. It's, it's, it's always that way. But then Rashbam knows that actually there's a little problem with this nice, tight distinction that he made here. He said, you know, when the verse says, one who unwittingly slew a fellow man, this is the JPS translation, which I use whenever, uh, it, 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 whenever I can. Uh, notice what the JPS did here. The, the verse there is talking about somebody who accidentally kills somebody else. And it uses the verb ratzach. And ratzach, we usually translate, Rashbam is saying ratzach should be, it should be translated as murder, but JPS just doesn't want to say that here. Unwittingly murder a fellow man, because we don't say that in English. So J J JPS is, uh, is making the English be a little more fitting for the way in which we speak English today, who unwittingly slew a fellow man, Asher Yirzach Bivlidat. Now, Rishbam comes up with a, uh, you know, a, a pretty logical argument why they would use the verb Ratzach in that verse, even though it is not talking about culpable premeditated homicide. Uh, Rashbam writes, since the greater context there deals with premeditated murder, the text says that if such murdering, Ritzicha, takes place unwittingly, then there is no penalty. So it's a, a reasonable argument to say that with, since the text is talking in general about murder, which means premeditated culpable homicide. And then it says, if, uh, if, if it was done unwittingly uh, and not in a culpable kind of way. And so it, it's using that same verb. It's a nice, nice uh, explanation. Um, it actually doesn't work though, because Deuteronomy chapter four is talking only about accidental homicide it is not talking about uh it it, it, it isn't talking about uh, uh premeditated homicide there's no reference to premeditated homicide in deuteronomy chapter four uh is it possible that rushbaum the general feeling is that there were a few copies of the uh of the Bible around the people were using. That's not like, you know, I'm sitting here with three different copies of the Tanakh uh, on, on, my, uh, on my desk. Uh, back in the 12th century, people didn't have uh, such immediate access to the text. And they very often, uh, they very often quoted the text from their own memory. It, it, 
Is it possible that Rashbam is confusing that verse in Deuteronomy chapter 4 with the verse in Deuteronomy chapter 19, which is almost the same language? That phrase, uh, appears both in chapter 4 and in chapter 19. Maybe, maybe he was referring to that. And in chapter 19, uh, it, the context discusses both uh, premeditated, culpable homicide, and also accidental, uh, non-culpable homicide. Maybe that's what he is. Uh, maybe that's what he's referring to. And so uh, he's making the point that there is a sharp distinction between uh, between Ratzach and Harag in uh, in Hebrew, in the same way that we have that distinction in English, and in the same way, Rashbam could be thinking about this but because, of course, he was, uh, aside from uh, his knowledge of Hebrew and Aramaic, he uh, spoke French on a, uh, on a regular basis. And in French also, we have a sharp distinction between the verb murder and the verb a to murder and to kill. Uh, and, and he's saying that there is that same distinction in the Hebrew. And now, in the next slide, we'll see why Rashbam is making this point uh, quite as strongly as he is making it. He says here, I offered this explanation as an argument against the heretics, the minim, that in Rahman's uh, Hebrew and in the Hebrew of many medieval Jewish uh, authors and classical Jewish authors, minim means Christians. I offered this explanation as an argument against the Christians and they admitted that I was right. Rashbam, a number of times uh, in his Torah commentary, mentions discussing the Torah with Christians. And there's this, this shift that took place between the days of Rashi. Rashi, we recall, was Rashbam's grandfather. Rashi, in his Torah commentary, never reports on any conversations that he had with Christians. It's likely that he did have conversations with them, but it is possible that in the days of Rashbam, there were more conversations between Jews and Christians about the meaning of the Bible and uh, Rashbam, as I said, a number of times in his Torah commentary, reports on these conversations. And when he reports, uh, he always says that uh, uh, I convinced them that I was right. Uh, you know, we don't have the version of, uh, of the Christians who uh, were talking with him. They admitted that I was right. And he says, even though in their Latin books, the same verb is used to translate the verb mem vav taf in the phrase when God speaking in Ha'azinu in Deuteronomy 32, God says, Ani amit va'achaye, I deal death and I give life. And of course, we would never translate. We wouldn't say that God said, I murder and I give life. That would be unthinkable to use a verb like that there. And the verb ratzach in this verse, in lo tirzach, thou shalt not ratzach, they use the same verb. And you can see on the left-hand slide, those of you who are uh, as old or older than me and in uh, Canada and were forced to learn Latin back in uh, high school, or some of you uh, might have actually studied Latin, even though you weren't forced to, uh, uh, to study uh, Latin, you can see that in the translation of the Ten Commandments, uh, Lo Tirzach comes out in Latin as non okides, and when God says Ani Amit Vaachaye, He says Ego Okidam et Ego We were Fakiam, and so that's that same verb there, okides and Okidam. It's fascinating that Rashbam uh, is alluding to what it says in the Vulgate in the Latin translation that they, uh, all the Christians around Rashbam uh, were using. Um, scholars argue about the question of whether this proves that Rashbam read Latin. I consider it unlikely that Rashbam read Latin because there was actually only one way to learn how to read Latin back in the 12th century, and that was in a monastery. Uh, there weren't, you, you couldn't take 
a uh, an intro Latin course at York University in order to you know, there was no there was like no neutral place for studying Latin and. Uh, I guess it's possible that he hung around with the Christians so much that they taught him how to read Latin. Uh, I, I personally find that unlikely. I personally find it likely that he was talking about the uh, the issue with uh, with the Christians, and they said, "Well, the, this is what it says in our uh, uh, in, in the Bible that we're reading." And he said to them, "Well, then the Bible that you're reading isn't uh, uh, isn't accurate." He finishes off. Aim low, dick the coup. The Vulgate, uh, the Vulgate makes uh, makes mistakes. Uh, a scholar uh, in, in Spain named Monse Lera, Lera uh, who did her PhD in uh, here at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, about a 12th century French scholar named Andrew of St. Victor from the Monastery of St. Victor, which is just on the outskirts of Paris. And we know that Rashbam lived in the north of France, and we know that he spent some time in Paris. I, I, we have no reason to think that he lived there all of his life, but we know that he was in Paris at various uh, points, at a point or various points in his uh, in, in his life. Uh, Monse Lera has argued in her book on the subject that uh, the strongest influence on the Bible commentaries of Andrew of St. Victor was Rashban. Uh, and she considers it very unlikely that uh, Andrew of St. Victor read Rashbam. She just thinks that it's likely that they talked about the text. And who knows, this could be a report on a conversation. Uh, they're saying, well, Andrew is always writing things like, in the Vulgate, it says thus and such. But the Jews tell me that, and the question is, who are these Jews who tell Andrew uh, and... and, and uh, uh, Monse Lera, who spent uh, 10 years living here in Israel studying uh, uh, modern classical and medieval Hebrew and the, uh, and the, uh, the flow of Jewish commentary literature has said that Andrew of St. Victor's uh, uh, commentary was most strongly influenced by, uh, by Rushbaum. Uh, I wrote something on the subject you can see at the bottom of this slide on the left-hand side here. Uh, does the Torah differentiate between murder and killing? If you want to read about this in, uh, in a greater detail than what you will hear today, you can look up what, uh, what I wrote at the website of the, uh, of the Torah, just uh, the Torah.com. If you don't write down that whole link, if you just write in a Google window, "Lakshan kill murder," you'll get <laughs> you'll get uh, this uh, uh, you'll get this article uh, this article right away. Um, okay, it seems that Rushbaum is making a uh, a strong argument here. Why is Rushbaum making this argument? Um, I think that there are two possibilities, but I think that in the bottom line, there is really only one possibility on the, uh, on, on the issue. Uh, I am skeptical about the idea that there was that there's something ideological going on here and that uh, Rashbam is trying to support Jewish ethics as opposed to Christian ethics. I think he's just talking about a linguistic issue. And we'll talk about that other possibility of a distinction between Jewish ethics and Christian ethics. I, I, I just don't think that that was a major theme in, uh, in, in the 12th century, a discussion of this nature. I see no other evidence about this, but I'll, I'll uh, say some more about it. But first of all, uh, I will point out, you know, I, I used to love this comment of Rashbam, and I, I used to be convinced uh, that he was right until I read uh, Professor Gerald Blitzstein's Ibranoli Racha's article about capital punishment a number of years ago, an article that I uh, that I have 
mentioned a few times here. And then I realized that there is a very big problem with Rushbaum's theory. So Blinstein says, many Jews believe that Judaism is a realistic, hard-headed system committed to a law of justice rather than a chaos of love. That those Christians, they say, don't kill, you know, that they're against, they, they claim to be against all killing and they believe that they think that love is the most important thing. An obvious line Jews often argue is being drawn between a faith that reads, you shall not murder. That's how a Jew should read the sixth commandment to read it as you shall not murder. And, and then the text is, Admitting that there are times when you would have to kill because, you know, if you if you want to defend the country that you live in and, and you want to have an army, an army is going to have to kill sometimes because there are bad people out there and they have to be killed. And one that naively and unrealistically demands, you shall not kill. Blitzstein is not saying that Rashbam had this uh, this uh, worldview, that that's the difference between Judaism and Christianity, the difference between you shall not murder and you shall not kill. And as I said, I find it uh, uh, difficult to believe that that was uh, what was motivating uh, motivating Rushbaum. Rushbaum was interested in language, and it's just like the question of what what's a good way of understanding this text. And in talking with the Christians, he he realized that they're they're using that same verb, okidei is okidam for these two passages, one for ratzach and one for uh, and, and one for harag. For those of you who don't know Latin, you do know this verb. You know it from suicide. Fratricide, all, all, all these uh, verbs in English where we use that C I D and uh, for uh, some form of, uh, of killing. Uh, but there's a big problem with Rushbaum's theory. There are a number of verses in the Bible. You remember Rushbaum mentioned one verse that didn't seem to go along all that well with his theory, one who unwittingly slew Yirzach, a fellow man, but actually there are a number of verses that are more difficult than that one. First problematic verse. Umatsa oto goel hadam michutz ligvul ir miklato v'ratsach goel hadam et haroceach Ain lo dumb. If the blood avenger comes upon him, the accidental murderer, outside the limits of his city of refuge, and the blood avenger kills the manslayer, there is no blood guilt. Again, look at what JPS did. I'm not blaming JPS. It's the Hebrew is so uh, jarring to say that what the blood avenger is doing is retzicha. It's murder. They use that for murder. The ratzach, and then to say at the end, "Ain lo dam." There's no uh, blood guilt on his account. And it's not culpable. You know, as we say here in Israel, "Osha, osha," one or the other. Either it's uh, either it's culpable. If it's ritzicha, then it should be culpable. And if it's uh, not ritzicha, then uh, that that. that if it's not culpable, what are you doing using the verb ratzach? Okay, so you might say here that the Torah might be hinting that it isn't comfortable with blood avengers. We saw Shadal saying that last week, that the Torah wanted to eradicate the idea of blood avengers, and that even though there is no formal culpability here, because the Torah did not feel that it could come right out and outlaw uh, all blood adventures, uh, the, uh, it, it's hinting to us by using the verb ratzach, uh, and is ratzach et harotzeach, that this, uh, this vendetta kind of atmosphere of the relative of the deceased deciding to do to the person who killed his relative the same uh, the same thing that was done uh, done to him. So uh, it, we have, have here the problem that the rotzeach is also uh, also somebody who committed accidental homicide, 
And, and so both of the uh, words here, both the word veratzach and the word harotzeach are in some ways uh, difficult. And if this verse is not difficult enough, here's another one that is even more difficult. And uh, Professor Blitzstein in Zichron Ali was not the first person to point this out, but he was the first person that I read that pointed it out. But after I read Blitzstein's article, I, I, I looked at all his footnotes and I, I, I found how many uh, commentators actually struggled to try to understand a verse like this. It's really hard. Kol make nefesh lefi edim yirzach et arotzeach. So I gave you a literal translation here. If anyone kills a person, the murderer may be murdered only on the evidence of witnesses. But we, we don't talk about a court putting somebody to death as committing murder, unless you know you are a, uh, a radical opponent of capital punishment, that you might be tempted to use the verb ratzach to refer to what a court of law does, but when the Torah said, uh, you know, make ish vamet, mot yumat, when it said that, uh, that, uh, that capital punishment is required, then what in the world is it doing here using the verb yirzach to describe what a court of law is doing here? They're, you know, they're, they're, uh, the, we have the testimony of witnesses, shadal, uh, I didn't bring you the text here, I'll just tell you, Shadal, Samuel David Luzzato in the 19th century in, in Italy, he's so troubled by this verse that he kind of, uh, he says, this couldn't be referring to a court. The Bible would never use the verb to, re to refer to a court. It must be referring to the blood avenger, which is difficult to say in the context there. But he says it just because the, the verb troubles him so much uh, and, and, and so he says it's referring that, that even the blood avenger is allowed to be a blood avenger only if there were witnesses to the crime. I think this issue came up before that, uh, about like what level of proof is required by a blood avenger uh, uh, according to the Bible. That's never made, uh, made clear in the text. And so uh, Shadal is saying that that's what's uh, going on here. But Blitzstein tries to take this, these texts in a, uh, in a different direction. You may either like or not like uh, what Blitzstein had to say about it. Uh, and I'll share uh, with you here what he wrote. He said, obviously I don't speak here of biblical law, which knows of authorized killings of war, self-defense and execution. But at the language level, the Torah teaches us that no word for the spilling of human blood could bear a less prohibitive denotation than any other. In other words, Blitzstein says, there is, uh, with apologies to Rashbam, there is no sharp distinction in Hebrew between Ratzach and Harag. As a, in English, there's no doubt that we have this sharp distinction between to murder and to kill. And uh, Blitzstein says there is no sharp distinction in Hebrew between, but in biblical Hebrew, between Ratzach and Harag. In modern Hebrew, as far as I know, in modern Hebrew, there is still this sharp distinction between Ratzach and Harag. Western thought distinguishes at a basic and indelible level, at the level of the word, between homicide and murder. Jewish usage does not make this distinction. Homicide means the killing of another human being, whether it is culpable or not. It, in any case, it would be called homicide. That's that CID root there. It's the, the killing of a, uh, of a human being is homicide. And murder means culpable. And Jewish usage does not make this distinction. The verbal integrity of the spilling of human blood is never violated. Homicide is not splintered in biblical Hebrew into the justifiable and the criminal. So that's Blitzstein's argument that uh, 
on a certain level, he, you know, he's trying to say in that article uh, that uh, Judaism, uh, that the opinion that we saw a number of weeks ago that said uh, that Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfon said, uh, had we been in the Sanhedrin, nobody would have ever put, been put to death by a Jewish court. Blitzstein is arguing that if that's not a direct outgrowth of biblical law, because biblical law is talking about all these uh, people who are put to death, he says it is a direct outgrowth of biblical thought and of biblical language. And the difference between biblical language and, uh, and, and our language is that we, in the West, we make a, uh, a, a strong distinction uh, between these verbs. And in Hebrew, we do not. Again, uh, Blitzstein is arguing the precise opposite of what Rushbaum argued. And uh, again, to remind you, uh, Professor Blitzstein, who uh, uh, just died uh, fairly recently, was a uh, great professor here at Ben Gurion University of the uh, of the Negev in uh, in Beer Sheva. Uh, is originally an American, and he wrote this article in the 1960s. And you might see a little bit of the spirit of the 1960s when he was a uh, student at Columbia, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where. Uh, <laughs> You know, opposition to capital punishment must have been, you know, in the air in those days. And uh, and Blitzstein has tried to argue that you can find hints of that attitude in the Bible. I am going to. Uh, I have more texts uh, on, uh, related to issues about uh, homicide, but they are about a different issue. So I'm just going to look at the chat and see uh, if there are questions to pick up now about this. Uh, okay. What verb is used for ear uh, hamiklat? So in the text there about the, uh, 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 sometimes haratzach and sometimes uh, harag is used there. If you punch someone during an argument and he falls down and smashes his head on a rock and dies, is that murder or manslaughter? According to the uh, according to the Torah, to the best of my understanding, that would be manslaughter. That it wouldn't be murder, uh, according to uh, according to rabbinic law. At, at, uh, at uh, Irene suggests to us that Rashi worked for the church authorities in Tra, perhaps. Uh, Martha says that she had to take Latin as a short-lived French major, useful for reading satiricon. Yes, uh, it is. it's a very useful language. Although when I was forced to read it, to study it in, in high school, we used to all write language as a language as did as did can be. First it killed the Romans and now it's killing me. But I have found shockingly that Latin has been useful for me in my own uh, scholarly work. Latin and Greek are still on offer at school in the UK. I took it up again at Haifa University. Very nice. That's great. Uh, and, and need it for, uh, th there are many things that we can use it for. Echo, uh, sim, solus, sum, solus. Thank you, Gershon. You're right. Echo, sum, solus. Uh, thou shalt kill the row. Dave, uh, contra opponents of Roe versus Wade. I'm not going to go there, Gershon. Excuse me. Uh, they are saying it's murder in legalese, English justifiable man, manslaughter, but the families cannot exact blood vengeance and the person who killed the other person would have to go to a safe city in the case of a, uh, somebody who pushed somebody, uh, witnesses versus jury versus son had reen, yes. Uh, could be any one of those things. Distinction in English would be murder and killing is also not consistent. Okay. The adjective premeditated is added to, uh, to murder as it, as it killed, as, as is killed him accidentally. Perhaps Rashbam meant to say that most of the time, that's possible. They're trying to say uh, that most of the time. Okay. Uh, thank you all for your comments and uh, Gershon, thank you for correcting uh, for correcting my Latin. I will try to fix the slides before I send them off to Torah in motion. And now we'll go on to 
the uh, to the next issue, uh, still relating to the issue of homicide. Basher lo tzada ve'ha'elohim ina ve'yado v'samtiv l'cha makom asher yanus shama. If he didn't do it by design, but it came about by an act of God, I will assign you a place to which he can flee. So we've seen this first before. We've discussed it a little bit before, but I wanted to talk about what aspects of this uh, of this verse or of this idea or of this halacha, if you will, that appears not here in Exodus. But we've already noted that these three verses about homicide say things in a very uh, uh, compact kind of way, and later books of the Torah unpack the, uh, uh, the laws in much more detail. And one of the details that appears in the book of Numbers and Bemidbar, and we'll read about it in the Torah in a few weeks, is how long a person has to stay, somebody who committed accidental uh, killing, um, how long that person has to stay in that city of refuge. So, in the book of Numbers it says, the assembly shall protect the manslayer from the blood avenger. Notice again, it's being referred to as a rotseach here, even though he's being considered non-culpable, again, a, a counterexample to Rush Baum's theory, the, the assembly shall protect the manslayer for the blood avenger, and the assembly shall restore him to the city of refuge to which he fled, and there he shall remain until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the sacred oil. This is a very strange rule that an accidental murderer has to stay in the city of refuge until the high priest dies. Let's see what different commentators had to say about this. So Rashi, citing some traditional Midrashic and Talmudic sources, writes, until the death of the high priest, who serves to cause the Shekhinah to dwell in Israel and thereby prolong their days. While a murderer, makes the Shekhinah depart from Israel and shortens the days of the living. He is therefore not worthy to stand anywhere near a high priest. So Rashi's first explanation here is that a killer and the high priest are uh, antithesis, they're, they're antonyms. The job of the high priest is to prolong our life. And what this killer did is that he, uh, he shortened somebody's life. And so you have to keep them away from each other. So as, as long as the high priest is there, we have to keep the uh, we have to keep the accidental killer away from him by hiding him away in a city of refuge. So there, clearly, it's being seen as a uh, form of strong punishment. And then Rashi says another explanation because the high priest should have prayed that this misfortune might never happen in Israel in his days. That to some degree, the high priest bears a certain responsibility for everything that goes on in society. The buck stops with the high priest. The high priest is in charge of the, uh, the, the values of our society. And he should have prayed that something like this wouldn't happen. And so, so why, would the, uh, why would it make sense for the accidental killer to stay in a city of refuge until the high priest dies? I think that Rashi here is building on an idea that appears in the Talmud. Let's imagine that your relative was a an accidental killer and went to the 
to a city of refuge to pray, uh, uh, to, to, to protect his life. Now let's imagine that you know that your relative is gonna have to stay there in the city of refuge until the high priest dies. The Gemara says that the families of people who uh, 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 of people who were guilty of, uh, of accidental homicide used to pray that the high priest would die. And so because the high priest did not fulfill his role of praying that things like this not happen in society, he finds himself living in a situation where a bunch of people are praying that he should die uh, soon. Of course, it could actually even be worse than that, that people might be trying to target the high priest and kill him so that their, uh, their relatives might, uh, might get out of this uh, uh, sort of prison. Um, so that's, that's how Rashi deals with the issue. Rambam tries to provide, perhaps they might say, a more uh, uh, rational and perhaps even psychological explanation. So here's what Rambam writes in the Guide of the Perplexed. The chance of returning from exile depends on the death of the high priest, the most honored of men and the friend of all Israel. By his death, the relative of the slain person becomes reconciled for it is a natural phenomenon that we find consolation in our misfortune when the same misfortune or a greater one has befallen another person. Amongst us, no death causes more grief than that of the high priest. In other words, what happens when the high priest dies? Everybody is so broken up about this, they forget about the other people who have died. There are other relatives who have died and they are no longer interested in being, uh, in being blood avengers. That's, a, that, that's no longer on their mind because now they have something bigger to worry about the fact that the high priest is dead. And so now it is, Ramam is saying it is now safe for the accidental killer to leave the uh, the city of refuge, the Ir Hamiklat, because it can be assumed that um, it, 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 it can be assumed that the relatives of the person who was were, uh, who was killed were not as uh, as upset about it anymore because now they have something bigger to be upset about. Another explanation of uh, Rabbi Abadia Sorno, Italy, from around 500 years ago. Uh, he offers, I think, I, I assume that most people would agree that this explanation is a little far fetched. It's creative, uh, but I think it's a little far fetched. There are many disparate types of accidental actions, some almost unavoidable, and others like negligence being closer to a volitional act. Something that is done accidentally, the cul th th there's a certain level of culpability in many of the things that I do accidentally. That, you know, if I, if I were more careful, uh, I wouldn't, these things wouldn't have happened. And so in everything that is done that is accidental, there's a different level of uh, culpability or of uh, responsibility. Accordingly, the Torah gives varying penalties to accidental killers. Some wait only a short time for the high priest to die and others die in exile before the high priest dies. So somebody could be there for the rest of their life and somebody could be there for a day or for a week or for a month because the high priest uh, dies right away. And the, so that's all interesting and creative, but then here's where it becomes a little hard to, uh, to swallow. This is the justice of the omniscient God who can thus punish each accidental killer in a manner conforming to the severity of the killer. So God arranges for uh, every accidental killer to be in a city of refuge for the appropriate amount of time. And he can do that because there isn't the same formula because the formula is until the high priest dies. And that could be like, any amount of time from uh, or from a day to uh, 
never in the lifetime of the accidental killer. And so, you know, if you have like 20 accidental killers sitting in a city of refuge, then to assume that, uh, th that it would be uh, uh, a, a simple and rational thing uh, for God to arrange the high priest to die at the time that's the appropriate time for, uh, for each one of them to have uh, uh, atoned for the culpability involved in their accidental killing. That, uh, that part of this seems a little, uh, a little stretched to me. Um, and, but I would like to finish off here with Rashbam's explanation on why the accidental killer stays in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. Rashbam writes, Following the plain meaning of scripture, this means that the murderer must stay in the city of refuge until the chief judge dies. This is like the idea of, Isaiah talks about the great king of Babylon, who never released his prisoners to their homes. That the person who is responsible for public order, if you have uh, murderers, if you have criminals walking free in the country, then this brings the uh, this brings the justice system into disrepute. And so as long as the high priest is alive and it's his job according to Rashbam to be uh, preserving public good in society, public safety in society, um, that is why the uh, it would be it, it would be like an insult to the high priest to have this murderer walking the street. Rashbam writes that here, you know, like it, uh, it expresses this uh, thought in I think I just counted them up in uh, like eleven words after saying here's the uh, uh, here's what the verse. Uh, uh, says, uh, later on, Chizkuni, Menachem ben Chizkia, uh, who often follows in the footsteps of Rashbam, he expands on this idea and he writes, until the death of the high priest, so that people won't speak poorly of the high priest when they see this murderer walking freely among people outside of the city of refuge with the high priest not punishing the murderer. And it is the duty of the high priest to do something, as it is written, should a man ask, act presumptuously and disregard the priest charged with serving the Lord your God. But no one would speak poorly about a new priest concerning an offense that took place before his term. And so that's why when there is a change of regime, uh, that is why various people get out of incarceration. And I, I, I'm sure you're all recognizing here that this idea of, of, of uh, pardons that happen when one regime finishes and the next regime begins. I think that Rashbam and Chizkuni and perhaps Isaiah are, are, are suggesting that same, uh, that, that same kind of understanding of what it means to, uh, to say that when the regime changes, people can get out of incarceration. It, the idea has been changed a little bit in the modern world with the uh, uh, presidents of the United States being petitioned to pardon various people before uh, uh, before the end of their term. I think that Rashbam and Chizkuni uh, are, are arguing that, that, that generally it would be like the new monarch who is coming in, the new 
authority who's in charge of public welfare who would say, you know, I don't have to worry about the enemies of the previous uh, regime. That was the previous, uh, uh, that's the previous regime. So when there is a change in the regime, that is a standard time when people are released and so that's how Rashbam is understanding on the Pshat level, why it is that a, um, that a, someone who committed accidental homicide would go free when the high priest dies. Because now we have somebody new in charge of public order in society. Okay. Um, I think, that this is a good place to stop. Yes. And I'll take a look again at the chat and see if there's. Okay. Um, what is the point of Ir Miklat? Banishment or protection? Bina asks. Really good question, Bina. It could be for punishment, or it could be for protection, it could be for atonement. All of these possibilities have been suggested by various uh, uh, thinkers. Uh, iPad, whoever that is, writes here, and didn't the mothers of high priests provide baked goods into the cities of refuge in order for them not to pray for the son's death? That's very good. That is what the Talmud says in Tractate Makot, that that's what they did because they didn't want people to be praying for their uh, uh, for their sons to die. And so that, uh, and Rashi is building on that when they say that, you know, the high priest should have been praying for things like this not to happen in his society or perhaps he should have been taking steps uh yes culpability sj Sachs says look at cigarette companies and roundup car companies that their products are not safe in every case certainly correct uh, Marty says, an admittedly tangential question, except for the Abu Dhabi and Yom Kippur, are there any halakhic differences between the responsibilities of the Kohen Gadol and other priests? Yes, uh, the Kohen Gadol used to bring a sacrifice every day in the uh, in the Beit Hamikdash. The Kohen Gadol also had the right to be the uh, all of the other priests had to go through a kind of lottery system or something like this to be the one who was responsible for any particular sacrifice on any particular day. But the Kohen Gadol could wake up in the morning and say, I can take care of these sacrifices today. I'm, uh, you know, so he, it's his shift whenever, uh, uh, whenever he wants. Uh, and of course, there are also uh, uh, more restrictions on the high priest. There are a limited number of people that a high priest, a, a, a Kohen has a limited number of women whom he is allowed to marry. And the high priest has a uh, smaller group of women whom he is allowed to marry. Uh, what is the point of your Miklat Benjamin? Start the Shorish for Miklat Kalat. Uh, uh, Martha asks, what's the Shorish for Miklat? Uh, 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 kalat in Hebrew means to catch or gather. And so that's the place that like catches you, gathers you in in order presumably to offer you uh, protection. Steve writes, safe cities. Or to accept. Or to uh, accept. To, to accept. accept, yes, to accept. In, I guess I think that that's a modern usage of it. Kalatata, but you know that you like you, know, you take that in. Did you understand that? Yeah, that, that's how the verb might be used in. Uh, Saraklita. What does it mean, Saraklita? Saraklita. That's right. That's a bit sort of absorption. Is the actual the absorption? Yes. To absorb so, them, so to give them a second chance. Yes, yes. So, uh, so, so the, these cities absorb these uh, murderers into the city, just as, uh, a, a, as a new country absorbs new immigrants into the country. You're absolutely right that that's a use, but I, I really don't think that that was a use that goes back uh, before modern times. That's, Steve, that's right? the reason. That's the reason that the Miklat, the inhabitants, were only Levine. From from Zara Aharon, it's again the relation between Aharon, the responsibility or teaching. Very nice. 
Very nice. Okay. Safe City suggests that there is some element of doubt about the homicide being accidental. No, there's just concern that the Blood Avengers are not going to be satisfied when they're told, oh, it was an accident, and they're going to go around trying to kill this person. He is not a murderer walking among them, but is that really believed? That's the problem, Steve. That's uh, right. That's the problem that uh, not everybody believes that the killing was accidental. Okay, I hope that next week will be the last session about homicide, and then we'll uh, go on, and uh, I don't even know whether it will uh, take up the entire uh, session, but I have one more thing that I want to talk about relating to uh, these verses about homicide here in Parshat Mishpatim, and then we will go on to the following verses. Uh, I, I wish you all a good week, and... Uh, can I ask a question, a quick question, I hope? Please, go ahead. The, the refugees in, in the Aray Miklat, so they were exempt from Aliyah Laregel the three times a year? You know, I don't, I don't recall ever seeing a text that discusses that issue, but it certainly would make sense to me that you would, uh, uh, <laughs> that you would have a rule like that. Uh, Martha writes now in the chat uh, <laughs> to me, speaking of homicide, uh, uh, enjoy the election coming up in your country. Uh, that, is, uh, that is true. Uh, yes. Uh, I, so I, I think that it's very logical what you're suggesting and uh, that the uh, person in the year Miklat in the city of refuge would not go up to Jerusalem because then Maho ilo chachamim betakanatam that would not do anything good uh, good for them. Uh, uh, Riyal Yala Regal, BS, how many actually typically perform it? Good question. They, you know, the halacha says that there, everybody is... Uh, is supposed to uh, is supposed to go, but who knows what compliance was like? We can't uh, can't prove anything about what compliance uh, was like. And thank you all, uh, Cassie and others, uh, for for your thank yous. And uh, I'll see you all next week.